on this edition of Independent Sources, Heat Seeker, the newest weapon in the fight for housing justice, and Latino artists and their contributions to American culture. Independent Sources, your window to the city's ethnic and immigrant communities. Here's your host, Gary Pierre Pierre. Between 2015 and 2016, New York residents made more than 200,000 heat related complaints to 311, the city's helpline. But only 4% of those complaints resulted in a violation. Now, there's a digital device in the effort to make city landlords more accountable to their tenants. It's called Heat Seek. HeatSeek is a thermometer that monitors temperature levels and transmits that data via the internet. Its designers say they want to make it easier for residents to gather stronger evidence when filing cases against offending landlords. I sat down with Heat Six executive uh, director Noel Francois to learn more about the device the and the group's strategy to bring a thaw to the perennial Cold War. Thanks for coming in today, Noel. I'd like to start our conversation by taking a look at part of a clip you're using to promote these web-connected thermometers. No one had heat. My daughter gets sick often every winter. She's two years old. And I had to leave the oven on sometimes to warm up the place. We've been fighting for heat for a really long time. During heating season, landlords are obligated to keep the temperature uh, at a certain level. And the level depends on the temperature outside. Every winter, there are more than 200,000 complaints about lack of heat. If the problem is ongoing, tenants are told to record the temperature by hand. The process is long and bureaucratic, and in the meantime, tenants are freezing in their bedrooms. It would be wonderful if there could be something like a sensor or some technology employed in order to catch the temperature when it's actually a problem. This little box is a heat seek sensor. It's a thermometer connected to the internet. It takes a reading every hour and sends the data back to a server so tenants and public advocates can check how cold it is anytime they want. It also generates heat logs that look just like the ones the city asks people to fill out by hand, only far more accurate than any judge has ever seen. So, uh, Noel, how does this work exactly? It's a thermometer connected to the internet. So it um, has a printed circuit board in it. It's actually built off of, um, it's called the Adafruit Feather. Adafruit is a tech company here in New York City, uh, which we think is awesome. And uh, it's a sensor that they have built that we then put a custom mm -hmm. circuit board on top of. Uh, takes a temperature reading once an hour, sends it either uh, by connecting to Wi-Fi and sending it over the internet that way, or for folks who don't have a Wi-Fi connection in their home, uh, we have a cellular option, so it talks to the internet just like your cell phone would. Mm -hmm. And so uh, where does this go? The, once you compile this data, where does it go? So first it goes to our web app, and so if you have a sensor installed in your apartment, you also get uh, an account on our web app, so you can log in, you can view your temperature data, um, you can print out your heat log. And then uh, what we do is we work with tenants and advocates and lawyers to help them use those heat logs to actually get their heat restored. So, um, you know, it's not just about like gathering the data, it's also about then, okay, what are we gonna do with this data to try to get the heat restored? So we've done all kinds of things from sending letters to landlords, we've done um, HP actions in housing court, which is like a housing court case. Um, filed for rent reductions, um, all kinds of different options, sort of depending on uh, what tenants have tried in the past. Cool. And, and how much does this cost? So the sensors themselves, this is a Wi-Fi sensor. This is our newest model, which we just uh, rolled out this year. The Wi-Fi sensors cost $99. Mm -hmm. We also do quite a bit of work, though, where um, if tenants qualify for free legal services in New York City, they may also be eligible for a free sensor. So we do a lot of installs for tenants uh, mm -hmm. free of charge. And then we also work very closely with legal service providers and tenant organizers. Um, and so when they're already working within a building on a heat case, we will go in often and install the sensors uh, to 
gather data to support that case. And so far, uh, how many have you sold, uh, or given away? So this is the first year we've ever even thought about selling them. Every year before that, everything that we did was grant funded. We're a nonprofit. Um, so we've been in about 100 buildings over the course of the time. That throughout the city or in one yep. particular place? So we work throughout the city, but we have focused primarily on the neighborhoods that have the highest number of heat complaints. And we can check that by going and looking at the city's open data portal and looking at people who call 311 and, and submit a heat complaint. And so we go to the neighborhoods that have the highest heat complaints, which are Flatbush, Crown Heights, uh, Bed-Stuy and Bushwick, East New York, and then uh, like Harlem, Upper Manhattan, South Bronx. Basically you know. the low income areas. Right. So uh, how much has this kept these landlords honest? Right, absolutely. So that's like the reason that we started this was to eliminate that he said, she said, no one really knows what the temperature is and you can argue forever and like no one has real data. So by installing the sensors, we can then say, look, we're a third party. We come in and we monitor the temperature. This is the data that we're collecting, and it shows that your apartment is or isn't in violation of the city's housing code. Um, and so it's actually been very effective. Um, we've done things like um, collect data for you know three weeks or something, and then actually send the data packet to the landlord with a letter on top that just says, we want to let you know that we're monitoring the temperature based on the temperatures that we've collected. It doesn't look like you're uh, meeting your obligation to be providing heat in the apartment. Uh, just a reminder, this is what the heat law is. This is how you're in well, violation of that. Are you working closely with the city to enforce uh, any of these uh, yeah. violations? Yeah, so we're still feeling out what that relationship with the city and with HPD uh, in particular. This is the housing like. preservation. And development, well, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're the ones that send out the housing inspectors. And so they have access to the data that we collect. Um, and in the past, we have been able to send them an email or give them a call and say, look, it's been 60 degrees in Ms. Jones's apartment for the past, you know, five days. And I don't know why she's not calling 311. Maybe she doesn't feel comfortable calling 311. Uh, but if you can send an inspector unannounced, you'll catch a violation. Has it been impactful so far? Uh, and then can you give us an example where you had right. uh, landlords actually uh, do the work that they were supposed to do? Yeah, absolutely. So we've had everything from tenants will, you know, have a conversation with the super and let them know, hey, we have these sensors now and we're monitoring the temperature. And all of a sudden it's the best winter they've ever had. They have no issues with the heat. We've done things uh, last year with the Brooklyn Borough President's Office. We did a press conference in front of one of the buildings that we were in, in conjunction with their legal aid lawyer, um, who had just submitted a case to housing court. Um, so we did this press conference. We'd been collecting data for like three weeks before the press conference, and it was consistently in the low 60s. Um, and you know, the day of the press conference, all of a sudden it went up to being in the low 70s, which is not in violation. It's a very livable, comfortable temperature. Um, and it stayed in the 70s all winter. Who came up with this idea and then uh, how did that come about? Because it's kind of interesting using technology mm -hmm. to high tech for a low tech problem. In right. Many ways. Right. So my co-founder and I came up with the idea. Uh, my co-founder was working late one night. What's the name? His name is William. Okay. Um, he was working late one night in an office building that was mostly like nine to five businesses. So they didn't heat the building on nights and weekends. He was working late, it got really cold. He got curious about how cold it actually was. And you know, your cell phone will tell you how cold it is outside, but, but how do you take the temperature inside? Um, so he is a developer by trade. And so he rigged up like a little developer toy that had a sensor on it to take readings and send them to um, a database. And that's sort of where the idea came from um, on the technology side, mm -hmm. on sort of the human services side. Um, he had a friend who was like, you know, this is really cool. My mom actually is a social worker in the Bronx and she has a client who is not getting heat in his apartment. He's learning disabled. He's not able to take the handwritten heat log that she would need in order to be able to advocate for him. If you're looking for someone to you know, test out the sensors, think this would be a great use case. And that's where the whole idea of, oh, there are actually lots of folks throughout the city who don't have adequate heat and don't have any way of proving it, and we could really help them. But is it a business? Because you said earlier you, you've been giving it away. Uh, do you 
what's a marketing plan, what's a rollout plan to make this? Uh, right. Thing? So building hardware is hard, <laughs> especially when you are sort of a scrappy team uh, with not a lot of funding. So we really spent quite a bit of time field testing and making sure that the hardware that we had developed was actually going to do the thing that we needed it to do and that it was going to be reliable enough that we would feel comfortable you know, making it available to the public. So we spent the last two winters really field testing it and also getting a sense of, okay, once the hardware is in place and we're collecting the data, how do we help people use that data to resolve the problem? So now we feel like we're at a point where we can go ahead and solve it. Okay, well, thank you, Noel. Yeah. You can learn more about how you can qualify or buy a sensor by visiting the website heatseek.org. Stay tuned. There's more to come on independent sources. Welcome back. We've talked a lot this season about the issue of literacy in New York City and how parents and educators can encourage a reading culture even when increasing numbers of bookstores and libraries are closing throughout the city. I spoke to Joe Humans, so executive director of Behind the Book, an organization that hopes to inspire New York City public school students to read. And with Dr. Susan B. Newman, a professor of childhood books, and literacy and education at NYU Steinhardt, about the reasons kids should black. read. But first, let's find out more about Behind the Book. These third graders are not just listening to a story. What they hear and see in this classroom is possibility. Welcome to Behind the Book, a program that brings accomplished authors into New York City public schools. The kids are so excited, you know, to meet an author and just the author inspires them to become better writers and it just helps them to believe that they too one day could become, you know, fulfill their dreams of becoming an author if they wish. To meet a book author is really cool because you get to know more about that person in the book. We saw Behind the Book in action at PS 154 in Manhattan with Paige McBriar, author of Beatrice's Goat, a story about a young girl in Uganda whose life is changed when her family receives a goat. And the gift of the dairy goat allows her to sell the extra milk to her neighbors and save up enough money to go to school. The authors in Behind the Book spend time working with the students, helping them to develop their own writing. I really do get more of a chance to interact with the students and we do some activities. It's not just me talking to the kids about a book. It's, it's some fun activities that we do and the fact that I get to come back uh, a second time and each child gets his or her own book. Those are all things that really um, reinforce the power of reading and the, and the power of learning and the power of community. Behind the Book is working in 68 New York City classrooms this year and handing out 4,500 books to students. It's a powerful process for kids going from reader to writer to true author. By the end of the program, the kids see themselves as rock stars because they've been through a lot of writing and editing with the author. They see themselves as friends with the author, again, even the high school kids. And if they write books, the books go into the school libraries and other kids have an opportunity to take out those books and they become the stars of the school. Behind the book is about reading and writing, but it's also about building confidence and critical thinking. All the programs we do are designed to make them critical thinkers, to make them have to think about what they're doing, develop their own opinions, back up those opinions. These are very basic skills that a person needs in order to be successful in the world. Success that begins by turning a page. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Independent Sources. Tell us more about this program, fascinating concept. I came up with the idea because I brought some authors into a school to help some people out. And then I was in the library and I saw how very excited the kids were and took ownership on all these books that they hadn't read before because they had met the author. So I thought that if 
I did a program similar to that, but more in depth in Title I schools, the lower income level schools in New York City that are having the most difficult with, difficulty with reading and writing, that it would be very, very effective. So we changed the program up to include giving the, the anchor text to the students so that they would read it in advance with the teacher. The author came twice, so the author would give a writing assignment and then work on the writing assignment with the students. And then a written piece was a part of the program. That was kind of the beginning, and we started with 16 high school classes. And then as we when, when, developed- When did you start? When did you start? 2003 was our first year in school. So we're, this is our 14th year. We're just ending our 14th year of programming. And what we've added since then is field trips related to the field of study. We've got four classes going to the UN this year. Uh, two have already gone, one a fourth grade class, two fifth grade classes, and a high school class. So of course the UN appeals to many different topics and many different books. Yeah. And then we also add in, we have two teaching artists on staff, so the art that the students do is related to what they're studying. And then we also bring in 15 volunteers into a classroom of 20 to 25 students, or 40 students, well not 40, but 34 sometimes, to help the kids with their writing as well as with research. So if we're doing a research project, we'll buy all the research books and we'll give them to both the classroom and if the school has a library, then we give books to the library as well. Okay, great. So Dr. Newman, you've done research on uh, book deserts, if you will. Uh, how effective do you find these programs in helping fight these deserts? Well, <clears throat> they're beginning, but they're not sufficient. Um, the programs like this are just wonderful, but the, the notion of book deserts often means that there are no books in that community for children. I, to I find that to. hard to believe. That is, is, is that true? That there are communities where there are no books? It Absolutely. So I'll give you an idea. Um, <clears throat> we're very interested, particularly in the summer slide, because this is when the children's scores go precipitously down if they don't have alternative activities during the summer. So we went to Anacostia, D.C. Now, this is someone right over Trump's backyard, for example. And we noted that there was one book for 883 children that they could <coughs> find to read over the summer. So you can say, how do we teach reading? How do we ensure that our children are reading if there aren't any books in that community? Mm -hmm. So what... Why is it more isn't, isn't being done about this? I mean, if it's so widespread, and shockingly so, if I may say, mm -hmm. why are we taking this on as a major issue in this country? I actually don't think that people understand the extremity of the problem. Um, they know that there aren't a great deal of books, and they often feel that libraries, for example, will pick up the slack. And libraries are a wonderful safety net for our children, but there are not enough of them. And in some of our communities, they're actually not there because of taxpayer problems and taxes. So for example, last year- Basically we, low tax base to justify the cost. Exactly, so last year, for example, we were in Detroit. And again, we were looking at book deserts and what we were trying to do is bring enough books there so that parents could read to their children. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing about this is that parents do want to read to their children. They just don't have it. And we found that the libraries were all closed in these high poverty communities. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, is really extreme, especially in the summer. So Joe, what, what, how much does this cost, first of all, and what would it take to scale it up? It costs us about $6,000 per program, and each program includes the authors, the books, travel for the author, and our time, the art supplies, et cetera. And we charge the schools. We charge the school 1,000, each school pays 1,000 per program. But I think a really important thing when we talk about book deserts, which I think is a great term, um, and I'm seeing it myself so much, is that it's not just the books. I think in order to educate a child and get a child to enjoy reading and use the skill sets they're being taught to read involves school and family as a partnership. 
And a lot of times, I know I grew up seeing my mother read the newspaper, my dad read a magazine, my brother read books. There were books around my home. Mm -hmm. The kids that we work with often don't even consider reading to be an enjoyable activity to do. And I think that's because they don't see that at home very much. But isn't that sort of basic fundamental function of the schools to really uh, teach kids to enjoy reading, I would think, and, and especially. What I think that's see? part of it, but if you yeah. go home and you don't see anybody at home doing it, it you're not going to want to do it at home. It's just like if your parents don't tell you to do your homework, you may not do it. Mm -hmm. But let's be careful not to blame the family. Oh, no, it's not their fault. Because I agree one you. of the things, you, you cannot do something when you don't have anything available. So in some of these communities, we found we could not even find a national newspaper. So Dr. Newman, what can be done? Why, let's talk concretely. So, so this is what we've tried to do. We've tried to convince, we've gone to proprietors and we've said, why are there no books for, for our children? And they say, well, parents won't buy them. So then we try to prove them otherwise. So we've worked closely with JetBlue. Okay, tell us a little bit more about that. I was going to bring that up. Well, the JetBlue, what we've done with JetBlue Airways is we've provided vending machines reaching parents where they are. And we have these vending machines. Remember Mike Bloomberg said, get rid of these snacks and these horrible sweet drinks. And instead of those sweet drinks, we put in books. Mm -hmm. And we find um, that parents come and use these vending machines. We put them in um, grocery stores and wellness centers. And they have books in them and people can put coins and get a book? No, they get free. <laughs> and you know what happens, which is so beautiful to see? Parents wait in line for their books because they care so much about their children. So when we provide them, they will come. We just haven't had them. What kind of books are these? These are wonderful storybooks. And one of the things that we noted is that parents want to train and teach children about their culture. So right now, we don't have enough multicultural books in our schools or in our communities. But when we do have them, what we find is some wonderful things begin to happen. Just a quick little story. Last year, we had a, a, a book about Barack Obama. And parents said, I want my children to read this book and to know about this president. This is the first African-American president, and that's part of our culture, and I want to convey our culture. We, Joe, is this something that you guys are thinking of doing as well? We do all the time. We focus really strongly on trying to bring in authors and books that, first of all, have the kids in them, have people of color in a picture book, or have people of color as part of the story. And we also try to bring in as many as possible Hispanic, uh, African America, and, and Chinese, because those are the schools we're in currently. And as we grow, we are looking for more diverse authors and we're very involved with We Need Diverse Books. Uh, I think publishing houses are taking notice and working really hard to bring in good books that uh, have diversity in them. But we use our authors in a sense as role models for the kids. Sure. We're not saying as, we say, as it said in the, the video that we want our kids to all be authors by any means. We're saying we want kids who can read and write and think critically. Whether they're going to college or not, if you're gonna read a contract, you should, you should know it, you're signing, et cetera, et cetera. We do give a lot away, away a lot of books. In fact, KPMG, the accounting firm, just gave us, uh, through First Book, we're allowed to buy, I think it's about 8,000 books, for the kids in our programs, which we're doing in their books. They'll either be books that the kids can take home and or books that they can use in the classroom. So it, they'll end up taking home books as well as having more books in their classroom libraries. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Wow. Jill Humans, Dr. Susan Newman, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, it's thank been a pleasure. You. Thanks very much for having me. Good. Finally from us, 
the second report in our two-part series about the Smithsonian's Natural Portrait Gallery and its initiative to bring more recognition to the role Latino artists have played in shaping American culture. This week, we focus on Taina Caragol, who became curator of Latino art and history at the National Portrait Gallery in 2013. Judith Escalona filed this report. Portraiture has existed since antiquity. The Assyrians had portraiture, the Egyptians had portraiture, the Greeks and the Romans, and so it is really an ancient genre of art. In the most general terms, we define it as the likeness of an individual. The purpose of the museum is really to tell the story of the United States through portraits of people who have made contributions of national impact. I'm the first curator of Latino art and history at the National Portrait Gallery, and my position was established in 2013 precisely out of the realization that Latinos were direly underrepresented in, in our collection. This is a portrait of Evelina Lopez Antonetti. It is by Frank Espada, Puerto Rican photographer, and Evelina Lopez Antonetti, also known as the mother of the Bronx, was uh, an activist and someone very much involved in um, city and community politics in New York who helped turn around the Bronx from a symbol of urban blight. This is a portrait of Piri Thomas by photographer Maximo Colon. And Piri Thomas is known for his memoir Down These Mean Streets that he published in 1967 and became a really important book um, in a, a genre of, of memoirs and autobiographies that was emerging in the 1960s uh, and that recounted the lives of people who had grown in real hardship and been able to overcome that. It's practically impossible to talk about the Puerto Rican diaspora without talking about Luis Muñoz Marín. The portrait by Francisco Rodon of Luis Muñoz Marín, which is really um, another landmark of Puerto Rican painting, as well as the Gobernador de Ustari's portrait by Campeche, but uh, is a completely different representation. It is a portrait of a head of state of Governor Luis Muñoz Marín, who was the first governor elected by popular vote in Puerto Rico in 1948. Before that, they were all um, assigned by the U.S. government. It is a portrait that is, you could say, a lot more honest and expressive than the portrait by Campeche. Uh, Rodon painted that portrait. He started it in 1974, already a decade after Governor Luis Muñoz Marín had left office. And the project of Governor Luis Muñoz Marín was visibly decaying, which uh, aimed at industrializing the Puerto Rican economy, and it did. And, and it was incredibly successful during its first 15 years. But then towards the mid-60s, it really started to decline. It was very clear that most of the income generated by all these industries from the U.S. that have been brought to Puerto Rico were, was being repatriated to the U.S. Another thing that was clear and that had been um, a byproduct of Operation Bootstrap was that Puerto Rico was now an island with a transnational population, and there were one million Puerto Ricans in the United States, of which about half a million had arrived during the years of Operation Bootstrap. I was very eager to bring that painting here in order to provide a broader context for our growing collection of portraits of the Puerto Rican diaspora. To be able to address through that portrait the history of how that community um, evolved. So we do like to consider portraits a, almost uh, an artifact, not, not, only, not only a likeness, a faithful likeness of someone, but also a record of that encounter between artists and sitters. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.